Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, to be respectful of everyone's time, I want to make sure that we get started right at 12 o'clock. Um, my name is Jessica McKenzie. I will be your uh, host for today's session. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome uh, to session one of our Black History Month series. Uh, I want to thank Brittany and Dr. Moore for being our, um, our speakers for our first session. Um, before we get started, um, I, I want to uh, wish everyone a happy Black History Month. Um, Black History Month is, is really uh, a wonderful, a wonderful time. It's, it's was first began as a way of remembering important people and events um, in Black history um, and all of the works that we do when it comes to um, our, our culture and our race. Um, despite constant adversity barriers and the experience of unimaginable violence and being prevented uh, certain levels of education and things of that nature throughout history, uh, African Americans have persevered, advanced and sought ways to help other people, um, not just individuals within our own way of race, but uh, sought out ways to seek those whom they saw were in need, underrepresented um, uh, communities, uh, populations, and that's something that um, I want to uh, ensure that we keep uh, in our minds and that we celebrate. Uh, it's in our DNA to thrive as a community. Um, and to do this, we need to seek ways to educate and support one another. And I think this series is a great example of ways that we are continuing to seek ways to educate um, and support and uplift uh, those whom we recognize um, may not have all of the resources uh, that are needed so that we can thrive and continue to excel in, in, um, in our lives. So today, I'm excited to connect um, all of us with our speakers uh, about improving health equity through the Urban Health Initiative. So welcome. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Moore and um, uh, uh, Brittany uh, Prince Evans. Dr. Moore received a Bachelor of Science from Union College and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. He subsequently completed residency training in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and fellowship training in craniomaxillofacial plastic reconstructive surgery at the University of Michigan. Dr. Moore is a professor at Emory University and the Chief of Service in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Grady Health System. Dr. Moore has a long-standing and profound commitment to training and development of learners from all backgrounds. His research focus has been in the investigation of factors involved in healthcare disparity with a particular focus on head and neck cancer incidents in medically underserved communities. He is the president and founder of Health Education Assessment and Leadership, also known as HEAL, Inc., an organization that began in 2004 as a traveling educational resource out of the back of Dr. Moore's personal vehicle. That's just amazing. Um, through this organization, he strives to educate the community on health issues, assess its needs, and in the process, build leaders from within the community to address those issues. This tra traveling resource has grown into the Healing Community Center, one of Atlanta's newest federally qualified healthcare centers. It also incorporates all of the major Atlanta academic institutions and community organizations in an integrated fashion to provide service learning opportunities while also providing the necessary care to those in need. Welcome, Dr. Moore. And along with Dr. Moore, we have Brittany. Welcome, Brittany. Um, Brittany is, uh, received her Bachelor's of Science from the University of South Carolina in Public Health and a Master of Health Administration from Clayton State University. She is a graduate of Emory Healthcare's Operational Development Program and Quality Academy. Brittany also received Health Coach and Lean Six Sigma White Belt certifications from Emory University and received her Tobacco Treatment Specialist certification from Mayo Clinic. Brittany is currently pursuing a doctorate in uh, public health at Georgia Southern University. Amidst her essential day-to-day -day operational duties, uh, Brittany works with Health Careers Collaborative, talk, uh, Tobacco Sensation, uh, and strives to consistently maintain positive rapport with her community partners. Her amazingness doesn't stop there. She also serves on eight boards. 
I'd like to highlight a few. She's the uh, founder and CEO of Wellstar Initiatives, Vice President of Healthcare Business Women of Atlanta, Vice President of the DeKalb Men's Health Task Force Board, and then also a member of the International Coach Federation. So uh, well, uh, join me in welcoming both Dr. Um, Charles Moore and Brittany. And I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Moore to start today's session. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, again, thank you for inviting us uh, to share some of the work that we've been doing through the Urban Health Initiative. Um, we hope that what we share will not only inspire you, but um, engage you to the point that you'll say that you can't wait to be involved in one of these activities or in another activity that you've always wanted to, to do. Um, so if we could have the next slide. What I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about the mission of the Urban Health Initiative. Um, the Urban Health Initiative focuses on providing health disparities education and advocacy um, and building partnerships collaboratively with community so that we can develop best practice models. And ultimately the goal is to connect folks in academia and organizations to community so that together we can can develop solutions and in the process of that advance equity and health and well being. And um, now, uh, Brittany, I think, is going to talk with you a little bit more about our, our leadership and some other aspects. So, you already met Dr. Charles Moore, who is director. As you can see, that our team is very small, but we are mighty. We have Dr. Jada Bessie Jones, who is our co director for education. We have Dr. Amy Webb Gerard, who is our co director dealing with monitoring and evaluation. We have Dr. Carolyn Amon. She works with our maternal and infant mortality team. We have myself as the assistant director. You have Joan Wilson, who is assistant director, where she works with our gardening piece. We have Dr. Bill Sexton, who is our senior advisor, who is one of the founders for Urban Health Initiative, along with Dr. Carlos Del Rio and Dr. Nadine Caslow, who is also a part of the founding team of UHI. Next, we will have Jessica play a short video about Urban Health Initiative. Health Initiative of Emory University is an entity that we brought together about eight years ago, volunteer one, uh, and addresses many of the social problems that uh, exist in our community. Urban Health Initiative's goal is really to connect community with academia, to get more knowledge about social determinants of health, to apply that knowledge, and then to also work together, community, students, to make a positive change. We have some really wonderful programs at uh, Emory School of Medicine through the Urban Health Initiative. The garden was started in response to uh, addressing the needs of a food desert area. In Atlanta, um, those areas or those zip codes that we service are really some of the worst of the worst statistics that you find. Our primary mission with this garden is, well, is twofold. One is education about nutrition uh, and the effect of poor nutrition. We also want to increase the access to uh, and the availability of fresh produce. People want fresh fruits and vegetables and other healthy items. Um, they just need to be exposed to it more. In this community, with the lack of grocery stores, many groceries here are bought at dollar stores or convenience stores where the options are not fresh produce, but they're, they're canned or boxed processed foods that are high in sugar and salt uh, and, and not the healthiest options. So we taught the kids how to prepare some of the foods that we have here at the garden. It's been really a wonderful experience because the community is really engaged. It, it's really 
quite inspiring to, to see all the transformations that occur for, for a number of individuals. Four years ago, I just, I was just knocked off my feet when it came, the program came in. Many seniors in this community are somewhat isolated. Uh, some of them still live at home alone. Some are, are, are widowed. Uh, some are taking care of a sick spouse or taking care of their grandkids. Coming to the garden gives them an opportunity to meet up with their peers. Uh, and that, that's a good experience for them. It's, it's also a good chance to get out, get some fresh air, and some sunshine, and uh, a little bit of exercise walking around and working in the garden. I see some seniors don't even come out the house, and when they come to the garden, they give them the opportunity to walk around. It was a, it's a lot of space down there. It was all walks of life. All ages would come out. Um, the young, the seniors, everybody would come out and work together. The students that come in, they are so happy, and they enjoy it. They really enjoy it. I really enjoy working with them. And I've, I've learned from the students. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a great experience all around for everyone, and many friendships have been forged out of this garden and our other gardens. With this work, our students are able to take learning from the classroom and engage it in community, working with communities to build skills in monitoring and evaluation, in identifying priorities, setting priorities, and setting agendas for research and practice. For our future funders, we would love to have you think about all the great work that's being done at Emory University and the Urban Health Initiative. Not only are our learners being impacted by the efforts that we're doing, but also the community members themselves. Uh, the collaborative problem solving skills that they're developing will have an impact not only today in real time, but for many, many generations in the future. I think one thing that we need um, are more individuals that are willing to volunteer and they, they can be on for a variety of things. I would love to see us continue to expand what we're doing, get more individual families involved, have um, a program so that we're actually able to go to individual families and just help support the work that they're doing, tie that back with health. Um, connect that with grocery stores so that there is much more knowledge about some simple things that you can do that will really improve your health. We are always looking for funding, volunteers, community support, research, ideas from businesses, ideas from other states or countries. So we welcome with open arms contributions of every sort and of course if we have financial contributions that helps us staff the urban health initiative provide stipends for our students from Rollins School of Public Health and the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, there's quite a business school, Emory's Law School, plus other universities like Morehouse School of Medicine, Spelman College, Clark Atlanta. So we really invite anyone who has personal, financial, or other resources to become part of the urban health initiative. Ultimately, our goal is to spread this knowledge as far and wide as we can. Thank you, Jessica. Can you um, pull the PowerPoint back up, please? And the next slide. Another, thank you. And so now we will tell you a little bit about the various different programs that Urban Health Initiative work with. One program that I have the honor and privilege to work with is our Health Careers Collaborative Program, where we work with 10th and 11th grade students across Metro Atlanta to encourage STEM education. Currently, we are working with Benjamin E. Mays, Lithonia High School, Reedon High School, as well as Clarkson High School in the area. Throughout the program, we have students that will go in there once a week to provide mentorship, and they will have a curriculum that's based on public health to go over with our students. Throughout the time, the students get to pick a public health topic that they get to research and have the opportunity to report out on it. We've had students to choose school shootings, 
drinking and driving around prom time, as well as STIs. The students get to display their presentation in whatever way they feel will be appropriate for them. We've had plays, we've had spoken word, um, we've had low budget films, and the students get very creative with this project. Also this year, we are doing a virtual college tour for our students, as well as also we did a virtual surgical robotics simulation as well. Next slide, please. We have our RISE program with Dr. Jada Bessie Jones oversee. And basically this program is to target underrepresented, I mean, underrepresented um, students in medicine and provide mentorship. We have our therapeutic gardening team, which Joan Wilson has opportunities to work with this program as well. Uh, this program is based on how gardening can help with um, formerly incarcerated people, as well as people who experience trauma, how it's a form of healing that we are piloting this year. So we're very excited about this program. We have our tobacco use prevention and cessation program, which was under the leadership of Dr. Charles Moore. At one point, Grady was not a sm smoke-free hospital and Dr. Moore aided in getting Grady to be a smoke-free hospital as well as providing resources for the patients. We use the Fresh Starts curriculum through the American Cancer Society, which is a four-part series where we have the opportunity to provide um, free courses to our patients to help them um, remain quit throughout the journey. We've also went a step further and used this program in the community and working with Columbia Residential, I mean, Columbia Residential Housing Authority as well as providing this opportunity to the residents there. We have our UHI Advocacy Corps. One thing that led from this advocacy core is having an interprofessional development course, which we're in our third year. We are working with students across Emory University. We have students from our nursing school, from our public health school, from our medical school. We even have some law students as well as students from the School of Ethics as well, where we're discussing the social determinants of health and how it relates with advocacy. The students get to have three different practicum tracks, including community awareness advocacy, as well as um, community awareness, as well as racial, um, racial uh, advocacy as well. We have our Emory Safety Manual, which is led under the leadership of Dr. Um, Carolyn Amen. She um, leads our training for all volunteers with onboarding them with um, safety, how to stay safe, and develop this into a course on Canvas, which we now have the opportunity to pilot with um, certain schools within Emory, as well as eventually branching it out to School of Morehouse, as well as Kennesaw State University. We also have our rolling suitcase drive, which we noticed that a lot of, um, which you noticed that homeless people around Metro Atlanta, they carry their belongings in a trash bag. And so this right here will help them have the dignity of a suitcase with um, carrying their precious belongings. And we work alongside with Atlanta Day Shelter. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Charles Moore. So, um... In response to the COVID uh, pandemic, we saw a number of things. We saw that um, people felt lost, that people wanted a place to get additional information, um, that there was a need to, de to decide if there was a way to engage at other levels. And we worked together with uh, Hope Busenius in, in the School of Nursing to develop an app that would allow individuals, congregants at churches, uh, other organizations to in real time um, have a way to figure out if there's a high amount of uh, people that are sick that might need additional resources so that they could allocate those resources. Um, currently, we're, we're, we're specifically focusing on engaging faith-based communities. And we have uh, three churches, one in Atlanta, one in Alabama, one in South Carolina that we are working on a pilot and then also expanding it out further so that we provide videos on things to 
um, keep yourself safe, videos on what COVID is, videos on the vaccine and provide a platform where they can ask us questions with the goal of creating more of a network and rolling that out to more and more uh, communities um, so that they then will also have the appropriate information so that they can make an educated choice. Next slide. We have a number of programs that are focused on food security and nutrition. And our goal here is to address issues related to food deserts. Next slide. And with that, you see in, in this slide that there are a number of different things that we've done. Uh, initially, um, we started working in the west side of Atlanta. And there we saw, as I've mentioned, that it's, it's a food desert. Um, we were able to partner with the Walmart that is there and um, encourage the use of, uh, for, for clients that come in to, to eat more fruits and vegetables and initially label the, the shelves with items that were preferred using the stoplight system. So green or preferred yellow for things that were not necessarily the best choice. And then red things that you should completely avoid. They allowed us to come in and label all of their, their shelves with um, that stoplight system and then subsequently work with Wayfield Foods, which has seven stores all in low resource communities. There we went in and one store in particular, their, their main branch and did similar types of labeling, but also trained the store employees so that they knew more about uh, eating in a healthy fashion. They knew more about general health uh, matters and then could connect uh, patients with health resources like the Healing Community Center so that there were multiple layers of support for folks so that they could be healthy. And in addition to not only training those store employees so that they could then be advocates for the people that came to the store, they then took that information to their own homes to um, in increase, increase the, the knowledge base of, of their families. We have worked with, with Grady, with a, a number of the partners that you see here, uh, in developing the uh, food pharmacy that is at the entrance. And um, that came from years of work, um, seeing that a number of patients did not adequately have the, the food choices that they would necessarily need to be healthy after coming to the hospital and also not having a sustained resource. So that's uh, an additional portion of what we do. Um, next slide. And here you see a slide just demonstrating that and all the aspects of it that include uh, the food pharmacy, uh, the healthy cafe, the farmer's market, a teaching kitchen, and that's connected all back with benefits enrollment. And we're always looking for people that might want to help in the teaching kitchen or help in any other way for this food as medicine program. Next slide. Another program um, that's been going on now for quite a few years is Walk With a Doc. And in that program, um, there is a provider that presents a short talk at the beginning of a walk that's out in the community. And um, prior to COVID, we were at the Lionel Hampton Beecher Trail. There we would um, have community members, have patients coming together with providers so that it provides a non-threatening environment. So folks feel comfortable asking whatever information that they, they want to ask of a, of a provider and they see that uh, medical people are just people too out there in the same sweats. It brings community together because sometimes people in certain communities don't feel safe walking alone, but they walk together in groups and it's a lot of fun. So we have converted it during the pandemic to a virtual session where we meet via Zoom um, and then we all exercise or go for a walk after that still uh, connected via Zoom. And it's been a great way to expand our reach. We now have people um, from other states as well periodically. Next slide. Another program is uh, Cancer Detecting Canines. What this is, is um, uh, Dr. Aidman in particular was able to um, determine a number of things that canines were able to do. And one was to potentially uh, detect early signs of cancer. And we thought, wouldn't this be a great way, uh, a low cost way to potentially identify if people had cancer 
if they had a recurrence of that cancer um, and be a way to supplement what we do in the, in the healthcare system so that we can broaden access to folks that otherwise might not, might not have the ability to get potential screening at, uh, at an early stage. And we're working with, with um, high school students, working with uh, folks in the School of Public Health, working with a number of folks to refine this program. Next slide. Uh, the maternal mortality and um, uh, mitigation program is multi-pronged. It's part of it is to focus on pregnancy spacing, to support the idea that once you have your child, that if you're able to wait about 18 months and uh, and when the child is walking before the mother gets pregnant again, that it's um, increases the likelihood of the health of the child as well as the mother, and also include a number of other uh, health tips along with that. Um, Dr. Aidman was able to uh, work with a group at Grady and is continuing to work with them to look to see uh, about issues related to racial bias, and, and particularly where it involves um, maternal child health. Um, she's been able to also connect uh, with um, a number of doulas and help provide training so that um, women that many times would not have the, the ability or the resources to get that type of su uh, support can have a, a doula help them through that birthing process. And studies have shown that there is um, increased uh, health of the, the baby and the child um, during that time frame as well as after. And then all of this work um, is focused on advocacy. Next slide. Dental Diversion Project is something that started out of uh, Grady as a result of seeing folks coming to the emergency department um, for non-emergent, non-traumatic dental issues, so tooth pain, and realizing that if they're coming to the emergency department for this, a place where they're really not going to get the type of care that they need, that that's a loss of resources, not only to the hospital, but to the ind individual for potentially transportation, the cost that they might incur for being there, cost they might incur for taking off work and a number of other things. So we created a program that individuals can be referred to a facility within the community um, to get the definitive care that they need um, most times within 24 to 48 hours. And we're now expanding that uh, to Emory Midtown. And the goal is to get additional facilities. Currently, the oral health center is at the Healing Community Center, but we will be looking to expand that even more. Next slide. The Emory Drexel Collaboratory is, is really an exciting new initiative that we have where we are focusing on trauma. So, with this, uh, the group from Drexel in Philadelphia and now also a group from Chicago, we are having meetings to discuss how we can uh, form a collaborative program to address trauma really across the lifespan. Uh, in Philadelphia, they've created these healing groups that have been tremendously uh, successful for youth. Uh, in Atlanta, we've um, been able to connect at a much higher level with community directly and the goal is to bring those two together so that there can be more of an impact directly where people live. And in Chicago, they are interested in having all of that brought together with them. Uh, next slide. Another program that we had, uh, that we have um, been engaged in is on the West side um, where I mentioned uh, Wayfield Foods, um, there was also another store that we uh, had worked with at that store, initially, we had created the, the first um, garden on the parking lot of a grocery store and been and able to work together with that store owner to not only have a teaching garden that you saw in the video, but also to work with him so that he started to provide um, more veg fruits and vegetables to increase the lighting in that store. And he found that, that his sales overall increased, which is huge. So that store unfortunately 
had to close as a result of changes in the uh, housing. And once they started tearing down a number of housing complexes, his, his base unfortunately moved away. Recently, that area that we were on has been recently uh, uh, purchased uh, through a public-private partnership. And the goal of this is to create a affordable living complex of about 140 units, of which 10% is for youth aging out of the foster system. It will have a teaching garden uh, for the community. It will also have a production garden. It will have a number of the programs that we've mentioned here to provide resources for the residents on site and effectively create a comprehensive living environment that will support individuals at all levels um, from uh, youth to seniors. Next slide. So what we've tried to do here is just give you an overview of a number of the programs that we, we are involved in. Um, there are others as well. Um, we look forward to your questions to see how we can um, hopefully engage you in some of this work or support you in whatever work that you're currently doing because we all have a place and we all have the ability to contribute something to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you, Brittany. Um, personally, um, when I uh, look through all of the programs that you guys have initiated and you're involved in, it's just amazing. And I think that the work that you guys are doing is, 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 is amazing and that it's uh, very much needed uh, within uh, our communities so that we can provide that support. Uh, to our to people of all ages. So thank you on behalf of uh, everyone who's attended uh, and everyone who has benefited from the uh, hard work that you've put in. Uh, just thank you for everything that you guys are doing and uh, everything that you plan to do in the future. So we do have uh, a few questions uh, from our attendees. Um, our first one, uh, <laughs> so many programs. This person is very excited. Um, how can you impact, um, how does the team um, try to focus on uh, the impact over time? And, and then also how do you um, kind of prioritize with all, so much complexity that seems to be in, in so many different programs and the, the, um, the individuals that you are targeting? So I'll start, Brittany, and feel free to jump in. What we try to do is really identify what the issues are in, in our communities and also create a system of monitoring and evaluation so that we know that what we're doing truly is having impact and it's meeting the needs of the community, not, not the needs of what we think the community wants, but what the community needs because you know people know what they need but in, often they're not asked. And if you ask people, they'll tell you what they need, how they need it. And what we need to do is try to, to work to create the environment that supports that work. You said it perfectly. I have nothing else to add, but when we even do grants, we even meet with the community to see exactly what their need is so we can write that into the grants when we try to work with the community. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question that we have, um, one of our um, clinical care team members, she states that uh, the team tries to make efforts to make sure that they're educating patients on um, about uh, weight loss and uh, addressing joint pain that contributes to, um, to potentially being overweight and then healthy eating, things of that nature. What are some uh, educational materials that your team um, or your organization um, provides that gives better verbiage on presenting this material to the patient base? And where can our clinical care team members go to, um, to gain access to those resources? So there are a couple of places that um, you can get access to that. You know, the primary care center generally has information and is on our, our on our at folks at Grady the Epic um, 
um, discharge forms. You can connect certain things that will give you some general information. But you can also come down to the, the, the food pharmacy and they have some information there. Um, you, there are a number of uh, organizations that we work with like Open Hand that has a tremendous volume um, of, of programs that you can review and get uh, information from that as well. Um, in terms of, um, you mentioned that I think mobility issues, we'd love to have people come to the Walk With A Doc program for each week, week there's a, a different topic. And so folks will learn a, a lot from that. Uh, many of the topics are focused on health and nutrition and mobility. Um, and you know you can email us uh, after and we can also give you some websites that you can go to. Awesome, w wonderful. And we'll make sure that we provide your contact information to the attendees as far as what the appropriate um, email address to send to so they can obtain that information. Um, to kind of follow up on uh, the question around nutrition and things of that nature, um, how important of a role would you both say access to nutritional and affordable, affordable prices um, plays a part when it comes to uh, preventative care within our underrepresented um, communities? Um, definitely is definitely very important. Um, I've, it's one of the social determinants of health. Um, we've noticed how some of the communities that we work with, the distance they have to go just to obtain fresh fruits and veggies, and these communities are disproportionately affected by high blood pressure, diabetes, and so if they have the access to it, I, we definitely believe that their um, chronic illnesses can definitely decrease in that area. What are some of the ways that you would uh, encourage our team members to, um, what are some of the actions that you would encourage them to take to assist in um, our community in these areas, like making sure that there's nutritional options available to patients that come in, um, ensuring that if there's any type of um, uh, outreach programs that Emory has to offer uh, to get them involved in, what are some of the steps that you would encourage our team members to take to just make sure that everyone's educated about those different offerings? So definitely utilizing the food as medicine track. I feel like that's definitely something that they can um, use. Um, if they feel like a patient um, have food insecurities, I know there's a couple of questions that they can ask and then refer them down to the uh, food as medicine where they can provide them with fresh fruits and veggies and also help them how to store fresh fruits and veggies the proper way and also help them to cook healthier as well. And, and I'll add to that for the, the um, folks that are on this session, don't think that there's nothing that you can't do to help because there is. Um, you can connect with any organization and, and volunteer. You can ask them what they need um, you to do. Even sometimes people feel that they don't wanna be out front and that's fine. You can be behind the scenes. You can do paperwork. You could volunteer to clean. You could volunteer to serve food. So there's so many things. Um, I, I'm thinking about um, our tobacco cessation program, for example, there was when we were looking for facilitators, which were Grady employees and, and, and Emory Hospital employees, there was one person that came to be a um, for the training and that person said, well, you know, I want to do this, but I, I don't need to be with people. And we were thinking, that's going to be a challenge for a tobacco cessation facilitator role. But we found out that he had tremendous uh, computer and IT skills. Um, and he has been essential in, in a lot of the work that we do. Um, so there, there's a role for everyone. So you, you both from the work that you're currently doing and, and from reading about uh, some of the things that you guys have started and initiated, you both seem to have a real true passion for being able to fully serve those who are in need. Um, would Are you both open to sharing a little bit of where that passion sparked from and, and what continues to drive you to try and, and serve those who are in need? Sure. I come from a very small town called Manning, South Carolina. 
And I was actually misdiagnosed at my local hospital. My hospital was ranked the top 25 worst hospitals in the entire nation at one point. Um, I am six feet without heels and I went in there for a, um, I tore my Achilles, but I didn't know that it was torn. And they misdiagnosed me and it caused me to have a more extensive surgery, which ended my basketball career, which I honestly at one point thought that basketball was going to be like my meal ticket into going to college. I didn't realize that how your zip code can have a direct impact to your health outcome until sitting in a um, elective course of public health. And when I when they discussed that, I just started quickly just Googling my city. And I noticed that for a family size, it was less than 30,000 that families were making in the city. We had higher rates of diabetes compared to the state, which South Carolina is definitely not one of the best states with diabetes, high blood pressure, and compared to the, um, to the nation as well, had higher rates of um, high blood pressure, higher rates of cholesterol. We had more people living under poverty. I even looked at um, the ratio for the schools, how my school was ranked um, close to the bottom of level of education and also seemed like the reduced, the free to reduce lunch, the comparison of that. And I just felt like I needed to be a part of that change and why not me? And I believe that public health is a ministry and I believe that we are all called to serve in some type of capacity. And so I feel like this is my calling and my purpose. That's strong, that's so, impactful. Um, so for me, I also come from a tiny little town. It's actually a hamlet. Um, <laughs> so not even quite a town. Um, but, um, you know, I'd always wanted to be in medicine according to my parents since about age four. And um, they supported everything that I did. And, you know, there's no one else in medicine. They put me in positions so that I would be exposed in any way that they could. Um, and then um, they, they put me through college and medical school. They paid for everything. Okay? So I had no debt which meant that each one of them effectively worked two jobs through that entire time. And I asked my father once about that. And he said, the reason that they're doing this is because he hopes that one day I'll help people like him and my mother that are just trying to do the best they can with what they have. And I've tried to honor that. Um, and then as I went through medical school, because again, I'm from a hamlet, so I didn't get uh, upstate New York, it's kind of tiny. Um, I got to see a lot of different things and I saw all the barriers that people routinely have. And um, I thought, you know, this just really shouldn't be. And I, I try to position myself so that if things aren't going well, I try to think, well, what can I do to make it better? And as Brittany so eloquently said, public health is a perfect way to do that, to reach out to folks. All the folks are just doing the best with whatever they have. I think it's everybody's responsibility to help them do the best they can. Um, and, and that's kept me energized over the years. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Um, what would you say, based off of your your goal and what drives your passion, and, and from the um, conception of the urban health initiatives and all of the programs that you put in um, place from the very beginning to now, uh, so far, what would you guys say are the most rewarding factors that you've experienced through these uh, initiatives? Well, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, uh, for me, I think one of the most rewarding things is to see folks that otherwise would not be engaged in this type of work get out there and see just, you see like a light click on and see um, students have told us, other um, volunteers have told us that they had no idea um, that they didn't know, that they didn't know, and that um, they can make a difference. And that, that's something that really has, I think, impacted people's lives in a way that they'll carry that with them forever and, and hopefully continue to find ways to be plugged in. 
I think Dr. Moore said it brilliantly. Um, only thing I can say is to that is just the opportunity to serve every single day and that it doesn't feel like work what you're doing because I believe that we were all created to serve. So that's the best gift, MLK said it best, the best gift one can give is service. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very true, very true. Um, there was one program that um, I noticed on the website that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned here um, and hopefully attendees get them involved. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Echoing Change program and how uh, individuals, if they wanted to submit something through it, um, how they can kind of get that information out and, and also submit something for that program? Yes, sure. So the purpose of Echoing Change, it is basically to shed light on the different um, racial divisions in America. Um, we created this program during a time um, where it was when the whole Black Lives Movement was very um, predominant in media industry. And we wanted to have the voice from all different people, not just from people who look like me. We wanted people from different backgrounds just to discuss um, how they feel about the current climate of the U.S. and what they feel that, like, how does it, what affects them the most about it and what they would like to see happen and what gives them hope throughout the time. And I will provide that link for you also so you can send it out to everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if individuals wanted to support um, the Urban Health Initiative and all of its efforts, where um, could they go to seek more information and to, to basically connect with either one of you? Sure. Yes. Um, you can definitely email me directly or there is a link on our website called Get Involved where you can fill that out and someone will be in contact with you. And we hope that we can gain some volunteers from this presentation. And Dr. Moore, did you, was there anything additional that you want to add? No, absolutely. Feel free to you know, email either one of us and um, we look forward to, to working with you. And again, if, if there wasn't something here that um, you saw that kind of piques your interest, if you have other things, send that to us too. We'd love to talk to you about it. Um, see if we can support your work in any way, um, just to, to get more folks um, out supporting our communities. Awesome. And uh, the last question that I have here for you, um, both reflecting on this month, um, what does Urban Health Initiative mean to communities of color and what legacy do you hope to leave behind? Great question. I love this question. Um, I think um, we hope to leave behind how we are impacting and changing the um, the language with health equity and shaping the lives, not only just for Metro Atlanta, but also we're working with other states like Alabama, as well as um, South Carolina in the process. So just trying to reduce, um, reduce health disparities and improving health equity. Um. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I, I think um, the only thing I would maybe add is that um, Urban Health Initiative hopefully is the spark that helps people to ignite their passions, to connect, to serve, and to thrive. I'm writing that down. That's, I, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you both. Again, I know that I've said that several times throughout this presentation, but I really am appreciative. Um, and so is the uh, entire MSK Fossil um, team committee. We're very appreciative for both of you for taking time out of your day to, um, to speak with us and speak with our attendees about everything about yourselves, but the urban health initiative, how we can get involved, make an impact. Um, and so we, we really appreciate you taking this time and, and educating us and giving us more information about the Urban Health Initiative. Um, we, the MSK Fossil Group, this is the first session of um, this month's series. We encourage you all, there are three more that we have this month. Our next one will be February 8th at 5.30 um, and the installment will be Racism in Medicine, Reconciling the Past, Present and Future um, with doctoral candidate um, Udadori Akwandu. And then February 23rd, we have uh, at 5.30, the installment will be Housing, Poverty, and Race and its Impact in Public Health. 
with Associate Professor of Law Courtney Anderson. And then on February 25th at 6 p.m., there will be a roundtable discussion with uh, various uh, MSK faculty with orthopedic and spine for all of those acronym. I know we're acronym crazy here at Emory, but our orthopedics and spine faculty team members, um, and they'll talk about the impact of uh, race and career development. So um, we want to thank all of our uh, team members and our MSK community for tuning in and for participating with your questions. And we hope that you have a wonderful and lovely day. Thank you both again, uh, Brittany and Dr. Moore. Thank you.